Let's talk about race. You know, you can't see the money can't be eaten. Assassins, right? It's where you be. Once again. But I got some help for you. Check this out. Here's the escalator. World dominator. Miseducator. Boom, toon, walk to the devil's lair. This virus of racist faces contagious to all types of places. Gotta peel layers off, and it ain't gonna get done soft. Discussion can stave off the bussin', fussin', bum rushin'. Politicians filibusterin', ways to usher in eugenetic disruption. Won't terrorize those with open eyes, not dealing with fakes who just wanna sit around and theorize. Meanwhile, in the street, another pair of police state hate related victims. The mind's eyes lay lifeless Looking at concrete Many topics, many ways to drop it My name is Ferris Saunders with the Racial Justice Collaborative, and this is Touch the Hand. This portion is called Touch the Hand because of how close in proximity we are to the history of slavery. Often viewed as something that is far off and distant or ancient history, we are so close to it that we can reach out and touch it. And my own personal example, my great-grandmother, who is still alive to this day, we have pictures of her picking cotton with her mother as a sharecropper. This close to the history of slavery, we can reach out and touch it. Something that's important to understand about the history of slavery is, despite its close association, in terms of how it's presented, in terms of how it's written about with the history and culture of the Southern states, the slave trade is of tremendous importance to the Northern states as well. The actual shipping and the transportation of enslaved people and a very important backbone of the slave trade itself was something that was dominated by Northern merchants and held an incredibly uh, close uh, importance to such uh, northern cities like uh, Providence, Rhode Island. You even have prominent institutions that are recognized and honored to this day that have direct ties to this with the uh, Brown University, an Ivy League school in Rhode Island, very famous and prestigious, being named after a slaveholding family. Something that's important to understand about the history of the slave trade in the United States is its role has a greater system in the triangle trade where we had goods going from Europe to Africa, enslaved peoples going from Africa to the United States, and pro uh, products made by those enslaved peoples going from the United States back to Europe. It was this uh, triangle trade, this interconnected system that was the historical backdrop for how all of this began and how all of this included and would evolve into greater manifestations of the slave trade in the United States down the line. In the history of African peoples being enslaved in the United States, despite this going all the way to the pre-state history, of just the 13 colonies, it exploded in value and exploded in wealth at a certain point. This point in the history of enslaved peoples in the United States would mark a vast change and ramping up of the people needed to work in terms of production of resources like cotton 
in order to maintain certain needs. This would mark how slavery became so much more important after this time and why the value of the individual slave would shoot up. The reason for this, historically speaking, was the cotton gin, which was a machine that was invented that rapidly increased the amount of cotton that could be produced. It was a hand crank machine that allowed for the rapid cleaning of cotton and the sorting of seeds from the cotton fibrous material itself, which you actually use to produce finished goods. There had long since been prior to the invention of the cotton gin an expressed need to need may even be an incorrect word, but it was a whisper that was that slavery and slave holding specifically in the southern states would eventually fizzle out and die. Because slavery was not economically efficient enough to justify the practice of such a thing. However, after the invention of the cotton gin, the amount of cotton produced only a few years after was tenfold what it had been prior. And as a result of this, slavery dying out because of economic, uh, 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 not being economically valid enough, that was nonsense. That was so far from the facts, so far from the truth. And so because of that, slavery only began to take off more. This gave rise to the phrase of King Cotton, in which the production of cotton in southern states, now amplified through the machine cotton gin, was so valuable and so economically powerful that it became king. It became the dominant force. Because of this, there was a greater necessity for enslaved peoples. And so 250,000 new enslaved people arrived in the United States between the years of 1787 and 1808. This was equal to the entire amount of slaves brought to the United States in the entirety of the colonial period before this point. All just in that short span of time because of how economically powerful slavery now was in the United States due to this machine, due to the rise of King Cotton. After 1808, individual or external slave ports and importation from Africa to the United States had become outlawed, but not the internal slave trade, which of course gave rise to continuations of so many practices such as uh, things that were basically slave breeding and maximizing how many enslaved peoples you could get out of the ones that you already owned or could trade for internally within the United States between individuals in the planter class. This rise, this massive boom in production in the South caused a similarly rapid and expansive boom of textiles in the North. In the former triangle trade system, the vast, vast, vast majority of production was made in Europe. And it was just raw resources that were transferred from the states or the 13 colonies back to Europe to be made into textiles and such in the factories. But now with this massive boom of increased production in the South gave rise to the production of factories in the North, which were now being made to mirror those in cities such as London. It was often immigrants to the United States that were fulfilling these roles and these jobs in the factories in Northern cities. And so that was a massive part of how that entire culture came to be. For the majority of this, we have been talking about what slavery and the cotton industry and all the economic values that this came into in both the planter class and the factories in the North, all that and what that meant to those individuals. But in terms of what this meant to the enslaved, in terms of what this meant to the individuals that were actually laboring in these fields in order to turn the wheels of this machine, it was more suffering. It was more atrocity. An entire amount equal to the 
century, over a century of time spent building this up since the inception of these original colonies in the United States. Equating what was just made in this short span of time because of how much more economically profitable it was, it was exponential increase of suffering and bondage. It's important to remember just how closely tied the North and the South are in the slave industry and how the entirety of the slave trade fuels each other together. As people generally only think of where the majority of slaves were actually physically kept or the majority of the slave labor was physically done, but all of this is an interconnected system. And thusly, all of this was just as heavily connected in terms of the economics of it in the North as it was in the South. Thank you for your time. I'm Farrah Saunders of the Racial Justice Collaborative. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about race.